Hi, um, welcome to the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, California Virtual Book Fair, and our special program, What's Cooking? Uh, my name is Jen Johnson, and I am a bookseller, a member of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, and part of the ABA's California Virtual Book Fair Planning Committee. For those of you who aren't aware, the ABA was founded in 1949 to promote interest in rare and antiquarian books and book collecting and to foster collegial relations. We strive to maintain the highest standards in the trade. All members agreed to abide by the ABA's code of, of, of ethics. Following this program, I hope you will consider visiting the California Virtual Book Fair at abaa.org bbf. Our book fair will be open continuously until 8 p.m. That's Pacific Standard Time on Saturday, March 6th. And just a few housekeeping issues. We are recording this session and it will be available at a later date on the ABA's YouTube channel. Um, and we're also live streaming this on Facebook. So we're gonna be Facebook famous. <laughs> if you have questions, we encourage you to move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and write your questions in the Q&A. And uh, the ABA's um, Eloisa Amesqua will help us with questions at the end of the session. You can also um, post some comments if you'd like in the chat area as well. And so it's my pleasure to introduce um, the people who are joining us today for this virtual tour of the ABA's virtual book fair. We have Linda Clausen, who is the Director of Special Collections and Archives at UC San Diego, which is the home to the American Institute of Wine and Food Culinary Collection with more than seven volumes, seven, seven, seven thousand volumes about culinary history. And Randall Tarpey Schwed, who is a collector of books and ephemera primarily related to 20th century California gastronomy. He's also the co-author of MFK Fisher, an annotated bibliography. And uh, joining us shortly um, as well is going to be Don Lindgren, who is the um, owner of Rabelais Rare Books. And he's going to be joining us in a few minutes. But as we get started, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to turn to Randy. Randy, you're a collector. Can you just tell us quickly your thoughts about as a as a collector? why it's important to collect culinary material what what's the allure for you yeah for me well i'm not a um a food professional uh, or anything like that um the i guess the allure for me is that i just have a general curiosity about history and culture especially american history and culture and um culinary artifacts are really a great way to access that. And I was just a couple of days ago, I, I started reading this great collection of um, essays by the late uh, New York Times uh, uh, reporter, uh, R.W. Apple, uh, who was just a great writer. And he wrote on uh, politics and war and, and, and all sorts of uh, sort of, I guess we'll, we'll call it more uh, uh, important, more foundational, uh, issues, but um, in the in the editor's intro here, let me just look at my notes here. He said, and that's why I, I've written it down here because I thought it was so appropriate uh, for uh, talking at this panel. He said um, that he regarded a, a country's food as the story of its people, its culture, and its history, uh, without which one couldn't hope to understand and report on a place. So I'm not a reporter, but I, I share that same kind of curiosity and I love cookbooks and uh, books about food uh, because they help me to, to kind of access that in some pretty surprising ways. Great, thanks for sharing that. Hey, um, Linda, so from a university setting point of view, what is your, what is your take on uh, why culinary is important and why in San Diego you have such a robust collection there? Well, I'd say the quote that Randy just um, read to us certainly holds true at the university also when we are interested in collecting materials, obviously in a lot of fields, um, but particularly, you know, in cultural history. Um, and you couldn't do truly cultural history um, without including the food and drink of populations around the world. And I would say our collections here broadly support studies in a lot of areas. So we have anthropology classes, we have medicine and nutrition classes using us. 
obviously history, American history, ethnic studies, women's studies, um, even art, because you can find some wonderful sort of artist books that have to do with food. And one in the um, ABAA fair this week is the beautiful Briot Savarin that Ariane Press did with the Wayne Tebow illustrations um, with, you know, and MFK Fisher um, writings. And even I would say some of our scientists were a very big science and medicine campus, but I would say the only people who have ever looked at our very expensive set of on uh, molecular gastronomy have been our chemistry faculty. I think possibly out of more out of curiosity, perhaps than a culinary interest. <laughs> Great. Hey, Don, thanks for joining us. We asked Don to like pinch hit really quick. So we're putting him on the spot. Thanks for joining us at the last minute. Oh, but no. what we're talking about is the, the importance of collecting um, culinary material. And of course, Don, you've made a career out of this. So from a bookseller's point of view, why, why did you kind of focus in, move in on culinary and, um, and in that area? Um, well, I, I, I was a bookseller in, in other fields before I, before I moved to uh, food and drink. But the, uh, I just found that cookbooks were perhaps like the, the best window into a culture. Um, incredibly you know, broad number of, of uh, different okay. avenues into right. understanding right. history, um, including, you know, the society uh, as a whole, individual communities within society, graphic design, technology. I mean, I could go on and on. All of it gets represented within cookbooks and within food literature in one way or another. And that doesn't even bring us to the, the joy of, of delicious food. Great. And we are so lucky because this this morning we have not one uh, culinary book uh, seller, but we have two. Ben is also joined us here, and um, I know he's trying to get settled in. So we're gonna we're gonna leave you alone for a second, Ben, and we're gonna like move into actually going through our tour now of the uh, some of the materials in the book fair. And so Eloisa is going to be from the ABA is going to be our navigator. So I'm going to ask her to start by going to an item that Randy had identified. Um, and Randy, do you want to talk a little bit about this as Eloisa pulls it up on the screen for all of us? We're going to be sharing the screen. Yeah. So the uh, the uh, item that Eloise is going to be pulling up is uh, called Coffee Through the Camera Lens. And um, this is really sort of a, a promotional um, a, a promotional item that was uh, published by the American Can Company, who had no interest in coffee except to sell cans to coffee uh, manufacturers, and it's uh, it's set up as a sort of a uh, an educational pamphlet for children to help them learn about coffee. Uh, but what's really cool about this is that it has photographs by Margaret Burke White. Now she was um, a great photojournalist. Uh, she worked for Fortune Magazine in the 1930s during uh, Fortune Magazine's heyday when it was just an, an incredible uh, design innovator as well as um, a kind of a promoter of the, the myth of uh, American industry changing the world. Um, and uh, she also went on to work for Life Magazine and she, um, along with some of her uh, contemporaries, um, uh, documented the, the Dust Bowl drought uh, in the 1930s. But um, this uh, thing has some incredible photographs in including the one that you've just pulled up here. There's one of, of the children here in uh, some coffee producing country, probably in South America. And then um, there's a, a, a photo a little later on of uh, a coffee worker lounging uh, in, in, the, in the, the wagon. I think it's one more on, right, there it is. He's got an umbrella, more like a parasol uh, probably, and, and uh, you can't see it very well, but there are um, you know, sacks of coffee beans, presumably. Uh, so, and, and the really cool thing about this, I mean, Jeff Hirsch, uh, the bookseller here, dated at 1936, but even if he hadn't done that, you know, you, you could guess just by looking at it, just by the sort of design conceits that it's, it's uh, you know, solidly from the 1930s. 
And it's really just a beautifully designed item. Um, and, uh, but I like the kind of intersectionality of, of you know, commerce, um, of uh, you know, the gastronomy interest in, in coffee, which could be more widely distributed uh, you know, with advances in transportation. Um, and the in, just incredible photographs. I mean, it's a commercial work, but they're really works of art. Uh, so I love this item. So that's true with a lot of this kind of uh, material that's more ephemeric, isn't it, Randy, that you have, oftentimes there's no publication date, so you have to look at other clues. Absolutely. Um, yep. And I didn't, you know, that may be a guess of 1936, but even, even if it's a guess, you, you know that that's when it, it was done, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, we're lucky here with this item because it has fabulous photographs, which must have a, an attribution to Burke White on them. Okay, great. So um, next we're gonna take a look, unless anybody else has something to say, we're gonna take a look at another item in the fair that Linda, you had identified that has to do with rice. It does, but I was going to ask Randy about this first, which I thought it was unusual, even with the little test in the back, that this was a book about coffee, but geared toward children, which sort of did funny. not seem <laughs> very funny. And I think I think that the, that 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 was just a sort of a um, an approach that uh, you know the can company was taking, which is uh, you know in their public relations department. Well, you know what can we do to, uh, you know, sell more coffee? Now, it's, it, it doesn't really make much logical sense, right? Children are not, are not the audience for coffee, but maybe they were trying to, uh, how do we say, groom future coffee future drinkers. Future coffee drinkers. Yeah. Could I, I'd like to just add something. The, uh, I've only seen it once, but uh, the American Can Company also produced a demonstration uh, uh, can with uh, vials of coffee beans in them uh, and a little metal carousel uh, that was sent to uh, to educators. If you were a high school teacher, uh, you might receive this thing and you could put it on uh, on your desk or behind your desk or something. So they they were really pushing this into the classroom to to make people think about coffee and hopefully I guess to get them to pressure their parents to buy more coffee. Yeah, actually, can you, is my audio coming through? Okay. Yeah, okay. I also, I also wanted to comment that in the beginning in the 19th century, um, around the earliest examples I've seen have been in the 1870s, there's a lot of companies like, for example, with chocolate and so on, that had started to issue pedagogic objects and books to be circulated in the classroom. And this is um, around specific foodstuffs. And this is something which is really part of, uh, kind of, I see it as a sign of the development in manufacturing and, um, and PR in, in various food, in, for various foods. And so that, that to me, that this is kind of um, trying to uh, uh, approach children or include children is not so unusual just because I think oh. it, was, it, was, it was happening in a lot of different foods during the late 19th, early 20th century. Okay, great. That's all very interesting. Thank you all for sharing that. So much information coming out of one piece. So now we're going to move on from coffee to rice. Linda, do you want to take well, this one? Right. I've never seen this in person, but it sort of appealed to me. I love the cover of it and the design of that. But I thought it was interesting. It's an early um, sort of charitable community cookbook contributed, um, recipes contributed by various people in the community who um, Probably many of them, as the bookseller um, points out, had African American cooks in their home, but maybe sort of society um, economics were changing and maybe they were doing it themselves a little bit more. But I also thought it was important because thinking of sort of um, the, the resurgence of interest in native foods and whether, you know, looking at some of these earlier books that go back to things that were grown and prepared in particular areas um, that perhaps were lost over the years or um, diluted um, some way um, over the years, but going back to some of these early books to look at um, things that were grown in a particular place and had a lot of people interested in cooking the local, um, one of the local um, food ingredients. All right. 
So let's move on from uh, rice then to Western barbecue. I don't know if that's a good transition, but I like rice and barbecue, so we'll go there. <laughs> so um, again, um, Randy, you wanna take this one? Yeah, th this is a really great book. I love uh, the fact that it's uh, got an interesting inscription and some letters laid in, but um, uh, I have a great interest in the um, kind of evolution of gastronomic sensibilities in California and in uh, the Western US. And so this is an interesting item uh, for me in this context. There's a sort of a confused um, dual usage of the term barbecue um, in this country. Uh, you know, the first denotes uh, slow cooking of meats. And that's a tradition that at least today, anyway, we associate with uh, the South and with a few Northern cities where there was a lot of uh, Southern a migration, but it's actually a very old tradition. And then there's what I call recreational outdoor grilling, uh, which is also called barbecue and which is a completely different uh, cooking technique. Um, and in the written literature in this country anyway, that uh, kind of barbecue, the outdoor grill cookery is uh, very much associated with California uh, and mm -hmm. the West. And it's mostly due to our terrific year round climate. Um, so, and in fact, uh, you know, the first, um, well, we believe the first commercial uh, cookbook solely dedicated to this form of barbecue cookbook, the outdoor grill cookery was issued by um, Sunset Magazine uh, in 1930. Uh -huh. A couple of years later, actually James Beard, who everybody thinks of as a more of a, a, a global citizen and, and a New Yorker, was actually from Oregon. Um, and uh, in 1941, he issued a, an important um, outdoor cookery uh, book. And both of those had um, instructions for how you would construct your own grills in your backyard or your garden, because that was really before uh, the manufacturing technology had evolved to where you could go to the hardware store and buy your own barbecue grill. Uh, but anyway, this book here is a little later, but I think it, it fits solidly into that um, kind of, uh, you know, that genre uh, and, and that space of being an important, um, you know, early outdoor cookery book in the Western uh, canon. Um, so it's a great item. You've got, Don, you've got a great eye uh, for everything, but. Thanks, item. Randy. And I, I feel a little embarrassed to be looking at my books here, uh, or <laughs> this one in, the, uh, in particular. I would just add one thing. Uh, I, I thought it was very interesting that some other uh, well-known um, Southern California cookbook authors uh, stopped to actually take a dig at this, at, not at this book in particular, but at the the idea of, of the outdoor grilling barbecue concept. And the um, Neil and Fred Beck in their Farmer's Market Cookbook, um, which is a, a great book. It's got an intro by uh, MFK Fisher. Um, you know, stop and say, basically barbecue is just a you know, it's it's great that we get together, but the food is just terrible. And they and they they say how much they like Bill McGee, but it wouldn't go to his barbecues. And I and I just thought that was so odd that it was just it because he sounds like an amazingly interesting character, and his book is really a, it's and the recipes look good. <laughs> great. So I think the next place we were going to go, uh, Linda, were we going to talk about a poster? Yeah, is this right? Um, yes, this is from, it was actually my um, way to get Ben to talk about some of the kinds of things that he's been showing lately having to do with food precarity and um, sort of the other end of the spectrum from gastronomy um, sure. at large, but sort of the, the people who are food insecure. Um, yeah. Do, do, do you want me to talk about ahead. it now? Yes, so I, you talk yeah, about so, it. So one of the uh, subjects that has become very interesting to me is um, kind of based on, you know, on, on dealing with antiquarian gastronomy for over 30 years now, I've realized that a lot of the histories and a lot of the um, exhibitions and collections that have been uh, put together around the history of gastronomy have really focused on haute cuisine and they've really focused on food for the top one or 2%. And, um, and that's, th there's a great, deal to learn there that's certainly rich and wonderful. But in fact, um, 
I would argue that the idea of gastronomy um, is not something that's restricted to the wealthy and that even farmers and even uh, young or, or poor people or people living near poverty also have a good, to have, can have a developed sense of taste and sensibility and understanding of food. And so I've sort of started this new genre called gastronomy and economic precarity. Um, and that's intended to include everything from food being served in prisons to um, soup kitchens for the homeless to the emergence of cookbooks that are intended for uh, either middle class or people starting living close to poverty. And you sort of see these, uh, these books emerge in the late uh, 18th century. And, uh, and the early ones are kind of connected to the French Revolution. And then by the early 19th century, you see them emerge in England and in other countries. And a lot of it also involves food policy. And sometimes you have a crossover of politics into, um, into gastronomy, into food, which has to do with the idea of feeding people. And, um, and so this particular item is, is, is related to that. There's another item in the fair. I don't know. I, I'm, and again, my apologies for arriving late here. Um, there's a book by Rumford, which is at Bowood's stand. I don't know if we can go there um, by uh, Count Rumford. Um, and uh, and Vowood, V-O-E-W-O-O-D. And Vowood, um, this Rumford book is actually really important. And Rumford himself um, really inspired a lot of people um, in different countries to, um, there it is, yeah. Um, inspired a lot of people to, um, to take on the idea that, that we should be concerned about how people are fed. We should be concerned about the food technology that needs to, be, uh, that needs to emerge in order to cook large quantities of food for, for people who are poor. Um, and just in the, 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 the necessary change in both government policy as well as in technology in order to um, help everyone get fed. And so this is actually quite a nice thing. This also has a nice provenance um, as well. Um, so, yeah. Great. So um, the next place that we're gonna go is we're gonna go take a quick look actually at um, kind of something that's a little humorous because you see this a lot in um, sometimes uh, some types of cookbooks and it's by John Bale. Uh, Linda, you pointed this out. It sounds like a perfect diet for me. So, <laughs> oh, you're muted, Linda. <laughs> we forget sometimes that we I forget. I, um, <laughs> yes, I this just sort of jumped out at me also because of the title, um, which sounds like a sort of an amazing um, diet. I it's just sort of I think falls into the category of food humor in a way. It's a seems to be something that. Um, you can just sort of, it's a, more of a poster with multiple copies of that and in the book, I'm not sure. Yes, if you follow this diet and you can lose a pound a day for a year, who of us would not try that, right? Um, not sure how the butter figures into that, but there you go. Gin and butter. Or just like food it. humor. <laughs> right. And there's quite a few like, this seems to be very common in cooking, like lots of different humorous types of things of people. I am sure that is true. <laughs> Especially when it comes to drunkenness. There's a lot of great car <laughs> caricatures and uh, woodcuts yes. yeah, that deal with different levels of drunkenness. <laughs> great. So uh, from uh, gin and butter, I think we're gonna go actually back to Rabelais again. Um, and we were going to look at a couple of things that have to do with seaweed, right? Or moss? Yeah, well, um, there are a couple of types of, of um, sea moss or seaweed that were identified early on as having various qualities for use in either culinary purposes or medicinal purposes. And I, I believe the medicinal purposes came first, but um, this book is interesting to me because it's, um, it's basically a report back to the uh, Royal Botanical Society um, of, of what was seen in Ceylon of the uses of, of sea moss that were put by the, the local people there. And it's a mixture of me medical uses, culinary uses. And so there's a sort of anthropological aspect to this report 
where they're describing exactly how they were they were they were using CMOS, and then also explaining how they thought it might be used um, in in England and other places, both culinarily and um, uh, and and medicinally. Of course, it get those seaweed uses get reduced down to basically being a sort of a, a gelatin of sorts. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have about a hundred years where that's what seaweed uh, recipes contain. Um, and I have another seaweed book that's, I believe, the earliest American seaweed recipe book, but it's all basically using seaweed as a gelatin. Um, but the descriptions of how the people in Ceylon were using this book, the, the, the uh, culinary uses are broader than that. I thought this was interesting. And the other one also, if you're going to talk about that, just because as part of UC San Diego, we have the Scripps Institution of Oceanography with a lot of people studying seaweed. And of course now more people being um, interested in culinary uses of seaweed as you try to feed larger and larger populations. Yeah, and, and um, I, I also, the other, oh, sorry, Jen, the other cookbook, uh, uh, I don't know if, if Eloisa can pull it up, but it's uh, it has a new Bedford, uh, Oh, actually it says, oh, it's New York, but, oh, by Aunt Priscilla of New Bedford. Okay, I thought maybe it had a New Bedford imprint, uh, but I thought that was sort of interesting too. You know, the, the New England connection, obviously, you know, New Bedford's be, uh, being a big uh, whaling and fishing port. Um, but uh, if this had a New Bedford connection, it would be pretty early for, for I think for that, um, that location, for any kind of cookbook, even one that featured especially one that featured seaweed. Well, here in Southern California, there was quite a large uh, seaweed farm near Santa Barbara. And I don't know if it still exists, but we've seen it actually on early property maps. Um, and it was for, you know, for consumption. And I, I don't know that I've ever actually seen anything like a pamphlet or a cookbook um from it but um, much of it was exported so um, it's pretty interesting um so we're gonna go back actually and now take a look at something randy you pointed out as well um there is a, a broadside a high society broadside that you wanted to talk a little bit about from tavistock yeah y yeah since we we touched on humor that i i think this is uh really quite funny but it also touches on an, an interesting influence in um, American gastronomy. So this, this is a broadside um, advertising the high society restaurant coffee house, which was on Haight Street. Um, it's been dated 1971, I guess by Vic. So, you know, high society, I guess would be what you might dismissively call a, a hippie restaurant, uh, whether you believe the era of the hippie was over by 1971 or not. Uh, but I love the double entendre of the name. Uh, and the illustrations are absolutely hilarious. Uh, there's someone who appears to be maybe sitting on a magic mushroom at the table. And then <laughs> someone is is smoking from a bong while they're eating. And then you have this couple under the table that are naked and you know they're making love down there. Um, so I think I think that's very humorous, but I, what interested me more, was that it's it's an artifact of of kind of the influence of different cultural trends in the 1960s and 1970s that have had a remarkable influence on how Americans eat today. I mean, whether you uh, talk about the emphasis on freshness of fruits and vegetables, the organic movement, um, you know, various so, I guess kind of a tendency to uh, indulge in in fat diets, which certainly did not begin then. But you know, you think about macrobiotic uh, diets, um, tofu. There's a fascinating book uh, by Jonathan Kaufman called Hippie Food that was published a couple of years ago. And if you're interested at all in that topic, it's really quite interesting. But I think this is a it's a very funny thing. I mean, you you might want to have it on your wall just because it's it's funny to look at. But it it uh, it does point toward the importance of what you'll loosely call counterculture in the evolution of our gastronomic trends. Great. Thank you. Um, ben, was there anything in particular that you, as you were scrolling through the fair this morning that um, you thought was interesting? I was wondering um, if not, 
there was one thing that I saw this morning that I was wondering if any of you might want to comment about, and it's in Liz Young's booth, Eloisa, and um, it is, um, it's like a ledger uh, from, I think, a, um, so she's Liz Young bookseller, and it's a ledger from, I believe, um, a, yeah, there it is, a tavern. So, um, you know, oftentimes as booksellers, when we get a hold of these things, you know, you don't know when you open them, what's going to be in there. I'm, not, I'm sure she had to do a lot of detective work to figure out that this was even a tavern. I don't know if anybody else has had a chance to look at it, but it's, it's very difficult to um, sometimes decipher that handwriting. So that was one thing that I that I saw that I thought was pretty interesting. I'll, was there... I'll comment on that. I, I, yeah. I find these things fascinating and, and mm -hmm. not being able to look closely at it, I, I'll, I can only say a little bit, but the, um, the ones I've, I've handled, it's been so interesting because it takes a lot of study before the interesting stuff reveals itself. And, mm -hmm. and um, with, with account books and ledgers like this, mm -hmm. you, you kind of have to understand whether this is an account of business coming into the tavern or business going out you know is this all of the material that was being purchased by the owner of the tavern in order to operate it or is this what he was selling to clients in the tavern or some combination of the two but you may find that what's interesting are the guests or the the mm -hmm. the, the clients or or vendors whatever you might want to call them so it might be individual um uh uh, others who are servicing or being or using the services of the tavern that are interesting, or it might be patterns of of uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. you, in uh, if you have one that actually shows what people were buying, you can see how how often are people visiting, how much are they drinking, what are they drinking. Um, well, apparently they're drinking rum and grog. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what I'm making out. <laughs> right, a lot of but, grog. You know, you find little things. This uh, one in one I remember there were. Uh, a long account that included both New England rum and West Indies rum uh, indicated separately, but they were both the same price and they were both purchased by people at roughly the same, you know, uh, uh, at roughly the same volume. So it seems like there wasn't a, a preference over of one over the other. So little things that reveal themselves, but these are so fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Um, any place else that we should be looking at? Anybody have anything else they wanted to oh, see? There's a charming book at um, where is it? Haywood Hill. We look at okay. it. It's called um, The Recipe Book of the Mustard Club. Haywood. Get to that. Okay. And it's just the reason it jumped out at me is I, you know, love reading detective fiction and good. British, you know, mysteries, and it had, keep, we'll get to that in a moment. And while, while Eloisa is scrolling, I'm just going to say that in the book fair, you can search uh, by um, a keyword, you could just put in, you know, mustard, mustard. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's also category listing. So you can actually search yes, by yeah, gastronomy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's types, so you could like click on just like ephemera, you can click on um, photographs, so. Yes, and if people are using the any of those fields, there are 25 pages if you're searching under um, sort of the topic subjects of gastronomy, there are 25 pages of material to look at. The reason I just loved this, um, given my interest in reading um, British mystery books. Also, you'll see that the text was written by Dorothy Sayers, who wrote the wonderful series of Sir Peter Whimsey, um, sort of detective stories um, in the early part of the 20th century. I just thought it was a wonderful connection. Um, she, this was done obviously for Coleman's Mustard, the great you know, firm which made that great dry mustard, um, probably still does. Um, and it also just made me think about, you know, the game of Clue and whether this, you know, Colonel Mustard was based on this or something, but I'd like to think that. 
Uh, Jen, there's one other book I wanted to point out, which is in Michael Bounsoff's book. If okay. they could, if someone could go there, and it's it's by, um, it's a 17th century book, but I think it's either Glauber or Gauber, um, and uh, it's a book on wine. Okay. Let's see. I think it's under Antiquaria Bonsoff on the over on the left there. Yeah. There we go. And then if you scroll, I don't know how he's got it organized. It's a pamphlet. It's further down. That's it. The yeah, Glauber, the, the last one. So what's what's interesting about this particular item um, for me, firstly, it's very early. Um, there are not that many uh, monographs on wine subjects published prior to 1700. And what's interesting about this to me is that um, it's about his what, what he learned in his winemaking practices and it involves a lot of uh, stuff about ke the chemistry of it as well. But what's interesting is that he also was a, a wine um, consultant and distributor of wines. And um, this is kind of interesting because in Germany, I've, I've noticed that it's typical that the early wine manuscripts and books that come out are actually by people who are involved in the trade itself. And this is always a very interesting perspective for people interested in who are wine historians, because a lot of the early books about wine are really about viticulture and, and uh, the cultivation of grapes. And there's not that much really written on the practical side of winemaking itself. Um, and so this is, this is quite early and quite interesting for that and quite rare as well. I've never seen it before. Great. Interesting. Well, yeah. um, so um, this would be a great time if anybody has some questions that they wanted to have um, our expert group here to answer. Um, that would be a perfect, this would be a perfect time if you have any of those. Um, or if there's anything else, I'd just like to say that, um, yes, there's many pages of under the gastronomy listing, but um, you have pages of things that are under $100 things that you know go for multiple thousands so this this whole area really has a lot of entry points for a variety of people so i was thinking that this year also when so many of us all of us have been sort of at home a lot and probably in the kitchen more than we have been in past years that there's um just a huge um interest in cooking these days i know i you know have a ritual, Sam Sefton, the New York Times. I have to read his column every time it comes out and try at least one new recipe um, from that. And I suspect that people are doing that with, with a greater interest in cookbooks and they will find terrific ones here. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd like to just uh, add to what uh, Jen said about um, many different entry points to collecting cookbooks. It, it really isn't a field where you can, you can pick a very narrow area of interest mm -hmm. and just chase down the material in that narrow field. Um, and at the end of the day, have a small collection of something that's really not been brought together as a group. Um, it's, it's amazing that if an area as important as African-American cookery has only recently been given the treatment that mm -hmm. it deserved by Tony Tipton Martin in her, her great book, the, the Jemima Code. Um, and she continues to build on what she did with that. But she brought together a group of, of books. I, I don't know the exact number, but I'm gonna say it's about a hundred books. Most of them were very affordable. And then she got to the tough ones. And, but the, the collection she built as a whole is is of of really great importance and i'm sure it, it will be when it when it lands in an institution it's going to be much study but there are hundreds of little tiny areas that one could choose to chase within uh cooking within food and drink um, and build a collection that takes up very little space and doesn't doesn't eat too much into your wallet so um um, in our um, chat, somebody has asked, what trends do each of you currently see in gastron gastronomy, book collecting, buying? Like, are there certain trends that you're seeing? Ben, you're making a trend. 
Yes, that's so, what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely am trying to get collectors and institutions um, attention with this new area of, of collecting or of, of, of collecting and making the material available to scholars, this idea of gastronomy and economic precarity. And I think what's, what I see that as a possible trend, partly because there's so many avenues of research that that material is useful for, whether you're looking at uh -huh. marginalized uh, societies or groups, whether you're looking at economic history, whether you're looking at criminal history of criminalization, um, whether you're looking at um, just um, the issues around nutrition and what different peoples were able to eat at, their, at certain times. Um, I think that um, I think that's it's certainly an area that's very rich and that material on the whole is um, is really pretty affordable because a lot of it is pamphlet material. A lot of it um, really hasn't been given its just due um, before. Um, and then of course there's the there's the more obvious fields such as you know as as you guys were talking about earlier, which would be um, you know African American literature that relates uh -huh. to anything connected to gastronomy um, and uh, Certainly, I would say uh, areas like immigrant cookbooks and things related to um, different immigrant communities that are coming into different countries and how that's approached and understood mm -hmm. by um, both governments as well as the countries that are receiving them. Um, I think all, and, and also, I think that in women's studies, there's new approaches towards looking at um, domestic science as seeing it not as, if, I think, see, if you, if you talk to people who are doing research in women's studies from about 20 or 30 years ago, it was kind of a forbidden area, um, domestic uh -huh. economy for women, because it was seen as the problem by, um, and, and there was different voices that were being looked for in women's studies. But I think now there's more of an embracing of it and more looking at the, the different um, elements of women's education that show up in these domestic economy books. Some of them even have sections on math, um, letter writing. Um, I even have one that has a section on the, the rights of women in connection to marriage and marriage laws in England during the 18th century. So a lot of these books are really much more um, multifaceted and diverse and have many more avenues of, of, to, to be approached by collectors or scholars than people have begun to realize. Mm -hmm. And I think that's finally coming into its own right now. So it's a very exciting time for the field. I, I agree with Ben and I, I'd add um, two aspects that are somewhat related and that, that that dealers, collectors, and institutions are all recognizing uh, more and more these days. The first one is evidence of use. That 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 cookbooks are, are remarkable vessels of, uh, of of where they've been and what they've been subject to and, and witness to, um, much more so than most types of books. I mean, the way people use a book in a household, the way they, they go back and refer to it, the way they use it as a container for additional information, they comment, they pass it generation to generation, and so on mm -hmm. and so on. All of that, uh, there is evidence of all of those types of, of, of uses that um, accumulates or accretes on cookbooks. And more and more people are interested in seeing that, especially if it, if it ends up being a really beautiful manifestation of, of, of evidence of use. Um, and Don, that way. actually answers a question that we had in chat. Somebody was yeah. asking, like, if you see stains, if you see, you know, it's such that, a complicated that. question. You know, often, you know, yes, books get damaged and can be destroyed or made uh, unusable because of their condition, if their condition is beyond a certain point. But there are there are books that are in. In still in very serviceable condition that have accumulated material, and then there's that really rare, marvelous book that is that is really almost morphed into a sculpture of, of sorts because it is just it's. I, I have one that I'll I, I keep in my bedroom that it's it looks like a flower. There's so much stuff stuffed into it over the decades. Um, it's it's binding is basically destroyed by that usage uh, by that use over over the years but it's become something else. And I, I appreciate that. I, I, I know it's a, a nightmare for librarians and archivists to look at something like that and know how to deal with it, but it's, it's, it's really lovely. And then there's a related field um, in cookbooks, which is the sort of uh, DIY vernacular thing that you see with a certain portion of community cookbooks, not all of them. But a lot of them you get people, and this happened with all sorts of groups, like there were, we mentioned hippies earlier, there were lots of sort of counterculture cookbooks that do the same sorts of things. 
where they go and they use the same sorts of materials, printing and binding technologies that most of us would be appreciating if we were looking at artist books or if we were looking mm -hmm. at, at, at you know, the avant-garde literary uh, little magazines of the literary movements. And, and there's you know, Mimeo and Ditto and wallpaper and all sorts of crazy materials that get used by you know, a group of church ladies in the same way that some bohemians you know, publishing poetry were, were doing in a different location. So it's, it's just, there's this really, really cool, you know, uh, well, you know, DIY vernacular do, uh, stuff that goes on with, with cookbooks as well that, that I don't see in too many other areas. One other thing, Jen, sorry, just quickly to, to touch on something um, that Don said there too, is has to, in terms of the book as an object, has to do with manuscripts. So with, when, you, when you start working with cookery manuscripts, you also really get a good sense of the book as a body that has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And you might see mm -hmm. the way in which that manuscript has changed over generations. You might, it might reveal the relationship between a mother to a daughter. Um, I once had a, a manuscript cookbook from England that uh, showed evidence of having been an immigrant's cookbook and had come to the United States. And so there's also, um, in, in terms of its use and its provenance, um, there's also a, a really often a really interesting story that can come through uh, in, in when you have a manuscript cookbook. So um, there's one last question in uh, chat, and then I'm going to just ask for any final comments, which is, how can a collector sell a large collection of notable, though not necessarily rare, modern cookbooks? Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the one to answer that. I, please don't call me. No, I, 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 it's, still, it's still perfectly doable. There are a lot of, of of good, solid used uh, bookshops that want to buy uh, those types of books. Um, general shops, are there are not as many specialists as there may have been at one point, but there are quite a few in California who would be interested in something in, like that. Um, I just bought a, 20 boxes of, of modern books, mostly lots of French material that I don't see that often. The problem is that we're, we're at a moment in history where there are a lot of people who are um, shedding their collections. And that has as much to do with population bubbles and shifts mm -hmm. in societal feelings about stuff as it does with anything else. There, But there's still, uh, you know, people still love some of these older books if they're in good condition. And you just need to, you know, I hear a lot of people think that there are only two choices. There's like sell something in a way that makes a lot of money or there's d dump it, uh, you know, at a charity shop, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, but there's there's still stuff in the middle. There's still, there's still possibilities. Um, if yeah. your books are a little bit more interesting, you're going to have more more choices. Right. Great. Well, I'm going to um, kind of ask us to wrap it up because I know people need to get shopping. They have probably been inspired by all of you to think about things they want to look at in the book fair. Uh, I'm going to turn to Randy. Do you have anything final to add here to this afternoon? Yeah, I would just uh, kind of echo some of what um, what we've heard from from uh, ben and Dawn about uh, from a collector's point of view, there are a million ways that you can uh, create interesting collections that are unique that somebody may have never done before that have a story to tell because there's so much material available in this kind of broad field of you know culinary artifacts and gastronomy. So I've had a, a blast. I've been collecting this stuff for 25 years years and um my biggest problem now is simply staying disciplined when i find something interesting <laughs> say yeah but randy do you want to start another collection but, uh, anyway it's great it's a great fun area to collect and and the 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 uh, the, the book dealers are uh so generous with their knowledge uh in my experience so it's a great great area to collect well, as we've seen today terrifically right i think yes and even we institutional collectors um you know, I mean, our collection is relatively young um, here at UCSD, the culinary collection that started in 1991, um, I believe, and has grown significantly. But we have, you know, collect in certain areas. And there are just so many, as Randy was saying, that you can collect in. And we said we would do this collection if it would support 
you know, parts of our academic program appropriately. And hence we have done a lot with um, Latin American and Mexican um, culinary works. Um, try to share those as much as possible. But there's just, you know, and totally rely on booksellers to help us. Um, it's a two way street. Thank you for to collectors <laughs> and institutions for making it possible for us. <laughs> Great. And Ben, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to unmute. There we go. Sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, the last thing I'd like to say is, is that, uh, um, you know, I've always viewed it as there's, there's a lot of parts to the rare book world in general. And this is, of course, true in gastronomy. And we each have our part to play. There's the librarians, there's the private collectors, there's the bibliographers, uh, and there's the booksellers. And, um, and I think that each, we all work together. Um, around this around this area of rare books, and the great thing that, that uh, collectors can do is that by being focused on a particular subject, as Randy was talking about, you know, and, and Don, that you know you can make a contribution with the with the most expensive, biggest thing, or the most narrow, mm -hmm. um, inexpensive thing, and we all we all have something to contribute to this world, and we all see different things, and. Um, and I think that it's through our communication and all working together that the discourse around the history of gastronomy can develop and go further. So, and I think it's only, it's growing at a very rapid rate right now. And it's an exciting, as I said earlier, it's an exciting time. Okay. And Donna, I'm gonna give you the last word. We appreciate you hopping in at the last minute. So oh, anything well, final to say? Thanks for having <laughs> me in my quick form like this. Um, I, I, I think what Ben said was, uh, uh, absolutely right and uh it's an exciting moment uh the last the last thing i would say is that um this is a virtual book fair um people put a lot of effort into uh bringing the books about to finding the books to describing the books to figuring out ways to display the books um and the mm -hmm. folks who put the technology behind this whole thing uh, but there's one thing that's missing uh, that that all of the booksellers and the people who attend the, um, the, the, the real book fairs in the past really missed, um, which is the ability to see people face-to-face uh, um, -face and very frequently at book fairs to, to share a meal, uh, to share a drink. Sometimes it's breakfast before the show, more often it's dinner after the show, but there's a, a huge amount of information and, uh, you know, and conviviality and sharing that goes on between people. And of course, that's all tied to food and drink, which is what we're talking about right now. So uh, we miss that and uh, look forward to having it again sometime soon. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all very much for taking part. Thank you to our audience for being here. Um, somebody said, let's do this annually. I'm all for it. And um, in the meantime, please uh, shop the virtual book fair and please um, look at the website to look at some of the other sessions that we'll be having. We have a, a session this afternoon about poetry. So join us for that.